I am. Okay. Our mission. Helping Parents Heal is a nonprofit organization dedicated to assisting bereaved parents. Through support and resources offered, we aspire to help individuals become shining light parents, meaning a shift from a state of emotional heaviness to one of hopefulness and greater peace of mind. Helping Parents Heal goes a step beyond other groups by allowing the open discussion of spiritual experiences and afterlife evidence in a non-dogmatic way. Helping Parents Heal affiliate groups welcome everyone, regardless of religious or non-religious background, and encourage open dialogue. Attendance at all Helping Parents Heal meetings is voluntary. All discussions that take place at affiliate-led meetings are confidential. We hope that participants will learn from and share with each other. Zoom meetings run by leadership are not confidential. These meetings typically feature guest presenters and are posted on YouTube so that affiliate members worldwide can watch and benefit. Neither type of Helping Parents Heal meeting is designed to replace traditional therapy or spiritual counseling. Helping Parents Heal offers a wide variety of speakers, allowing parents to learn about many possible ways to heal. This includes presenters covering progressive topics such as afterlife evidence and connecting with our children who have passed. The views expressed by our guest speakers may or may not reflect the opinions of Helping Parents Heal leaders and members, so we ask that you take from their presentations whatever may benefit you personally. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad you could be with us tonight, and thank you, Gary. It's just going to be a great evening. Yes, thank you, Gary, and thank you all for being here. And I just feel so grateful. We were just telling Gary how much everyone loved his keynote address at the last conference. In fact, um, one of the biggest groups of people who really loved what he was saying um, were the dads who were at the conference um, because he is also a, a man, but he's also a PhD. And he, um, I'm going to go through his bio just to explain how learned Gary is. And um, we're going to be talking about one of his books tonight that had a profound influence on my life as well as on Irene's life, and I know that it had a profound influence on a lot of people on the meeting's lives as well. Gary E. Schwartz, PhD, is a professor of psychology, medicine, neurology, psychiatry, and surgery at the University of Arizona at the main campus in Tucson. In addition to teaching courses on health and spiritual psychology, he is the director of the Laboratory for Advances in Consciousness and Health. Gary received his PhD in psychology from Harvard University in 1971 and was an assistant professor at Harvard for five years. He later served as a professor of psychology and psychiatry at Yale University, was director of the Yale Psycho Psychology uh, Physio Physiology Center, and co-director of the Yale Behavioral Medicine Clinic before moving to Arizona in 1988. In September 2002, he received a $1.8 million award from the National Center on Complementary and Alternative Medicine of the National Institutes of Health to create a center for frontier medicine in biofield science at the University of Arizona, which he directed for four years. Gary collaborates with Canyon Ranch on biofield science and energy healing re research and serves as the corporate director of development of energy healing at Canyon Ranch. There are lots of other things that I can talk about, um, but I want Gary to have a chance to speak. So I'm just going to say he has published more than 450 scientific papers, including six articles in the journal Science. Gary has also co-edited 11 academic books and is the author of The Afterlife Experiments that came out in 2002, which we will be discussing this evening. And without further ado, please join me and Irene in welcoming Dr. Gary Schwartz. Welcome, Gary. Well, hi, everyone. 
Um, this is actually a very uh, special moment for me. I should confess this because Elizabeth and Irene asked me to share with you a look to look back at the actually the first book that I published that reported research that was focused on research on the question of life after death that was called The Afterlife Experiments. And it was published 20 years ago. This is the 20th anniversary of that particular book. And in many ways, that book is among the more interesting um, books, in particularly in terms of its, um, how it came to be. And maybe what I'll do is quickly tell you how it was birthed so we can put it in context before we talk about some of that research historically um, and then how it relates, of course, to the present. So here's, here's the backstory. The backstory is that I began doing research in this field, initially secretly, and then more publicly. Um, and some of you may have heard that in 1999, there was an HBO special called Life After Life, um, a two hour documentary, which by the way, is still available in full presentation on YouTube for any of you who are interested. And they included a 12 or 13 minute segment of actual research that we conducted for that um, documentary. It was the first time ever that multiple mediums were tested and actually shown real in real time. I mean, real time that that was live, it was recorded. Um, but an actual experiment documenting under controlled conditions that certain mediums were real, that not all mediums were fake or frauds and so on. And we then did a second experiment, which was called the um, Miraval experiment because it was conducted in, um, it was hosted by, Miraval, which is a, a health resort in Tucson. And the third one was called the Canyon Ranch Experiment because it was hosted by Canyon Ranch. Um, and by the way, I should I should um, indicate that that bio that you read is a little bit outdated, Elizabeth, but it's fine. You know, people, we don't necessarily, people don't necessarily ask me if there's anything new or anything old. <laughs> but I retired from the ranch a, a few years ago and now the number of papers is 500 as opposed to 450, little details. But the important thing is that I, I want to honor the fact that I'm I'm no longer with Canyon Ranch. The owners, um, they've themselves retired and a few of us retired in, that, in those responsibilities as well. Anyway, there was no afterlife experiments book. Um, so how did it get birthed? Well, one of the mediums who participated in all three of those experiments and was, um, what's the word that I want to use? Um, more than instrumental, he was really pushing for this research to be done, was someone by the name of John Edward. And I think some of you probably know of John. And John's a New Yorker, like I'm a New Yorker. And oh, by the way, so is Suzanne Northrup. Um, and we New Yorkers can sometimes be a little pushy. Um, and anyway, John, who I was forced by the totality of the evidence to conclude that he was the real deal and he was gifted in what he did and still is exceptional in terms of his accuracy and in his, in his passion and in his love and caring. He's an extraordinary person. Anyway, I was forced after these three experiments that uh, to conclude that I have to listen to him very seriously. So he is flying back from Canyon Ranch via, I think Texas or Atlanta, I can't remember, to um, New York. And he calls me from the airport. And he said, Gary, he said, my guides are telling me that you have to write a book summarizing these experiments, that this is really important. And you've got to write it in a way that the public and particularly parents who have lost children can understand. He said, you've got to do this. 
And I realized I didn't want to get in trouble with his guides. And the, uh, so the, the um, I realized that if he felt this strongly and they felt this strongly, and remember, I, as a, as a scientist, I have to follow the data. I figured, well, if there was that much reason for doing so, I would make the time to write that book. And so we can, in many respects, blame this book on John and his guides. Isn't that interesting? It's, it, that's, so I, I want to thank them for this. Um, before we talk a little bit further about the book, I think it would be helpful. I would love to hear from each of you how it was that the book played a role in your life, Elizabeth and, and Irene, and also the experiences you had replicating, I think, some of this with either mediums who were in the book or other mediums as well, because I'm not sure everybody who's on the call knows all that. Would you mind sharing a little of that? Yes, I think that that's a very good idea. I think that it would be wonderful for Irene to speak to that. And also, before she does so, we've had a lot of people asking in the chat, but just uh, privately to me about your gorgeous room behind you. Could you <laughs> maybe just elucidate and let people know what's going on there? <laughs> oh, uh, thank you. Um, I am in my study, which, by the way, has... I'm a sort of a ring of monitors around me because uh, I do scientific work. And, and my study then looks out into our living room. And you'll notice a lot of artwork, which is um, some of it is Southwest Native American art. Some of it's Pacific Northwest Coast Native American art. Some of it is African. Um, I began collecting many years ago. And then when Rhonda and I got... Uh, uh, got married and also she had this passion as well and then we really started collecting as a as a couple and we don't have children we don't have grandchildren so the 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 uh the artwork becomes partly a, a, if you would a family and um we also don't have pets so it's safe to have all this art around so as a result we um Rhonda likes to refer to our home as the um Schwartz Tribal Native Arts Museum <laughs> Well, it's absolutely beautiful. And um, thank you for explaining that. And and we have, it's interesting because people keep private messaging me. Please ask Gary about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, anyway, so that's the answer. And I had said that you were so kind to tell us as well. Um, I'd love for Irene to start by explaining her own journey with this wonderful book and documentary um, and sure. everything that you've done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, after Carly passed, I had always believed in an afterlife. But when she passed, I set my sights on, I had to find her. I knew that the love that we had for each other couldn't die and that she, I knew she was somewhere. So I decided to take, to try to take a scientific approach. And of course, thank you, Google. I typed in scientific evidence of the afterlife and it immediately took me to Gary's book. So obviously I was meant to, to read the book and also to find the documentary. That to me was just amazing. M many of us early in grief with our grief brain have trouble reading and comprehending and absorbing, but you can watch videos. So I watched that video mm. over and over and mm. over again. It was, became part of my life and it brought me hope. I knew that it was possible to be able to connect with her because of that. And I wanted to make sure that it was someone that had been tested, tested scientifically. And I went on to have a reading with George Anderson that changed my life very early on. I set my goal at the reading that I just wanted to know that Carly was okay and she wasn't frightened when she passed. And within minutes of sitting across the table from George in a Long Island hotel room where he did his readings, he said, you've had a daughter that's passed and she wants you to stop obsessing about her passing. It was as easy as walking through a doorway and your mother was there to greet her. And that was, 
that's it. It started the journey. And not that the journey wasn't difficult, but knowing that she was okay, that she was very much alive on the other side of life changed everything for me. And I went on to have a reading with Lori Campbell, who was one of the mediums in that um, documentary, as well as with Suzanne Northrup at an afterlife conference. And she is a hoot. I am in New York as well, Gary. <laughs> and, oh. <laughs> yes. And she, oh my gosh, she was amazing. She, um, I, I won't talk a lot about it, but she did, we did a small group reading and she pointed to me and just like this, you, you, you got a lot of dead people behind you. <laughs> it's like, oh. A lot of, a lot of your family has passed. <laughs> and she went on to bring a lot of people forward. And one of the amazing things that Suzanne did was she said, there are two men in your family riding around this room on a motorcycle, vroom, vroom on a motorcycle. Who are they? My grandfather died in a motorcycle accident on July 4th, 1933. And my cousin's son, named after my grandfather, Nicholas Bello, passed on a motorcycle 70 years to the day after my grandfather did, July 4th, 2013, on a motor in a motorcycle accident. So there they were, my, my uh, cousin Nick and my grandfather riding around the room with Suzanne Northrup. So it was incredible. And the book is amazing. Every once in a while, I'll pick the book up, reread it, and you always just find something new. So thank you very much, Gary. Well, I feel really fortunate to be so close to where you're doing these incredible studies. And actually, one thing that um, the one of the reasons that I found you initially was because of the fact that Morgan was at the University of Arizona and he was on an exchange program um, in China, in Nanjing, China. Um, when he went to Tibet and passed at the base camp of Mount Everest, which is the, this is the last picture that he took that was on his camera um, when he was in Tibet, actually. And um, having you there at that university was so significant to me. And I've been able to visit your lab uh, there, which was absolutely amazing as well. And perhaps maybe this would be a good time because when I visited it, it was specifically to see about the soul phone and the studies that you're doing there. Maybe you could just tell us a little bit about that right now, just so that people know what you're, what you're doing in this laboratory that's so amazing. Sure. Um, and I'd be happy to do that. And I had your you're bringing back and refreshing my memory about this. It's very, it's very special. But before we do this, I have to ask Irene a question and make, then make a comment. Um, okay. First of all, Irene, when did your, um, when did your son pass? My did, daughter passed. Did you, I apologize. Um, that's okay. Um, February 17th, 2013. 2013. So this was already 14 years after that documentary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But because it was on YouTube, you were able to find it. And that documentary you went and watched, you said many multiple times, and it was it was inspirational to you. And I, I yeah. presume then that the that the experimental part was meaningful, the part at the University of Arizona with those mediums. Absolutely. That was, where the, that was the only real part of the documentary that was the evidential part. As you know, it they was, tried, it was the they, proof. It was the proof. <laughs> the proof. Yes. It was the, the proof. Yes. Okay. And also, Elizabeth, when did your son pass? He passed in 2009. So it was the 20th of October of 2009. And I actually had a shared death experience with Morgan. So he um, was on the ground. He was not responding. He wasn't breathing. And he was undergoing CPR. And his roommate, when I called and I was able to get him on the cell phone, um, told me, Miss Boisson, I don't think that uh, it looks good. And I asked Colin to put the phone up to his ear. And I told him that we loved him, that we were proud of him and not to be afraid. And I had the most incredible hug from Morgan. And 
I didn't know what I believed at that time, but I certainly didn't ever think that this was going to happen. And I, I just, all of a sudden, I was in such bliss. I was so taken with this hug that I got from Morgan. Mm -hmm. And my husband was sitting next to me um, at his desk and he said, let me speak to him. And I said, no, I, I'm so sorry. I, he, he can't talk to you, but I just knew he was in a wonderful place. And I was so heartened. I mean, it was such an amazing thing to know that at the University of Arizona, where my son had spent almost four years, he was a senior when this happened, that this groundbreaking research was being done. And I, I just felt so grateful to be able to be so close to something that like this that was happening that was saving so many lives. So um, anyway, I also just want to say that Irene also had read um, many books by George Anderson, but one of them, the walking in the um, garden of garden of souls, souls yeah. is, is one that I had also read that she actually called her Bible. And I think that wow. um, that came out in a reading with Suzanne Giesman as well. And that was just such an amazing thing. So there are so many things that have happened as a result of the work that you've been doing, Gary. So we feel very fortunate and very grateful. Um, and it is amazing. I, I guess I hadn't realized when we asked you to come and speak about this book that it was the 20th anniversary, which is wonderful. It, yeah, it's very special. And and I I, I pay attention to coincidence. Um, uh, the, and so I, I, I find it most curious Irene, that you were, that George Anderson was so important in terms of being evidential for you and is obviously meaningful to Elizabeth. But it was the one of the few stories I was trying to think, well, is there any particular piece of data or evidence when people ask me, you know, of all this work you did, were there any particular pieces of data where you were as a scientist forced to face the fact that all of this and more was real. And if, if you ask me uh, what was maybe the top of all of it, it was a moment that I had with George Anderson in the HBO special research, but it wasn't on the documentary. Um, and I, I may have mentioned it in the book, but I don't remember, but I'll give you a little bit more of the backstory because it's extraordinary. George Anderson, who I had not met, Matter of fact, I hadn't met any of the mediums um, except for Laurie uh, of the five. I had only met Laurie, and then the others came to the University of Arizona. Um, I had, I knew of George Anderson because I had read a book that was written about him, and I'm trying to remember by a by a a writer, a popular writer. So I knew about the claims made about George, but I never met him. And as you know, George is a New Yorker. He's relatively short, deeply Catholic, um, and he's um, relatively quiet. Um, at least he was in the context with me. And he came with his uh, his manager or, or person who served as an assistant to him. And he said, um, George is here, and George has brought a present for the sitter. And he would like to give this present to the sitter. And I said, excuse me, he brought a present for the sitter. He doesn't know who the sitter is. I don't even know who the sitter is because the sitter was kept secret from me and was selected by the producers of the TV show. So people couldn't argue that somehow I was in cahoots with the medium who was on the TV program who could be giving them this information. And to make sure that the TV people weren't in cahoots, we agreed that I would pick a sitter that they didn't know about, so that we could then be each each of us would be held accountable. All right. So I said, "How could you have a present for the sitter? You don't even know who the sitter is." And I said, "This is not part of the research." 
So I said, however, if after we finish the formal experiment on camera, if you then would like to share this information, this present, I'm happy to, you know, to make it possible. So then George, you know, he gets hooked up. We were recording EEG recordings, both from the mediums and from the sitter. Um, and George did the reading. Um, and as you know, his reading in terms of just numerical accuracy was the highest of the five. And that was reported in the book. Um, he, um, after the meeting was over, his assistant then knocked on the door and said that they would he would, would like to have the president brought in. The president is then brought in. And George explained that um, very often when he does did this did readings then, and he since uh, repeated this to me, that sometimes spirit will come to him a few days before a reading and will ask him to bring a special gift for the reading that's going to happen, partly as a way of this being evidential. Of course, I had never heard of such a thing. I mean, most people have not. And, I'm, and I said, really? And he says, yes, he ha it happens fairly frequently. So um, I said, okay, so we, the, the, if in the documentary, the, uh, the, the medium was on, one side of a screen and the sitter was on the other so they so they couldn't see each other particularly when they're looking face looking ahead at the camera and so we the the system brings the package in it then gets handed to the to the sitter the sitter opens up the package and breaks down into tears why because it turned out that in this box was a um in the package was a a copy of a Catholic prayer that it turns out the sitter secretly would say to her daughter, who is now deceased, when she would pray to her daughter every night um, uh, in honor of her daughter. And nobody knew that she was doing this she had kept this quiet from everyone and yet the he brings this prayer as a way of the daughter who had committed suicide and was the primary person that she wished to hear from um was provided it's, could you imagine what it would be like to lose a daughter and you've lost multiple people in, in your life but the 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 uh the and now I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure whether there's a daughter or a son, just like I confused daughter and son with the two of you. So I apologize. It's one or the other. But this, the critical thing is that that prayer was the one that was, that was said. And that the, uh, could you imagine what it'd be like to re receive a spontaneous gift from a medium ahead of time, but as a capstone? to after having had this incredible reading in general. Gary, well, can Gary, to, yes. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to add that, um, you know, I set my intention with George to find out that Carly was okay when she passed and not frightened. And he gave me a gift and he gave me a picture of St. Joseph, who is, he said, your daughter has a, a gift for you. He told me right away and then went on and St. Joseph is the patron saint of a happy and peaceful death. And my Wait, intention- again, I have to make sure that I'm hearing this correctly. <laughs> yes. So I am now hearing from you, and this is being recorded. Yes. And this by parents, you know, in many parts of the world. Mm -hmm. We are having a spontaneous moment right now, Irene, that the moment that, I, the thing that I was, telling you was for me one of the single most pieces of important of evidence of any that I've ever heard of, which by the way has never been followed up with formal research. I now confess this only to hear it replicated mm -hmm. that George said right. to you. What? Wait, we aren't even done yet because at the <laughs> conference that you were the keynote at, George brought another gift for the person, for the woman that he gave a reading to during that, that 
first talk that he gave when he got there. Not only that, but this woman, Irene, had just signed up maybe two days before the conference. Is that right? And maybe George bought the gift before Brittany had passed and knew that he had to bring this gift to the conference. Brittany passed. I registered her mom for the conference just a week or two before the conference. And she was the only person that got a reading. And out of 450 parents, there was only one Brittany in spirit in the crowd. And George had the name. It was Brittany. So yeah, it was, it was incredible wow. to witness. Wow. Well, you know, the being trained as an orthodox skeptic as well as orthodox <laughs> agnostic, okay, um, the, I always have to rule out, you know, the possibility of cheating before we rule in that this is real. And if you can't have control over a situation, you can't be quote 100% sure. What was beautiful about the research, when you do research, you have increased control as in unlike real life where, you know, more things can happen. And so what's truly beautiful about these experiences is because I was able to do research where the probability of this being anything other than genuine is, is virtually zero. I mean, it has to be real. That then provides us with further reason to accept the fact that both of you have had these experiences in, the, in this respective realm, that they're also most likely real as well. And George well, really yeah. deserves, George really deserves. Um, yes. And um, he autographed, he autographed the book, Walking in the Garden of Souls for me. And on the left side, he wrote the Lord's Prayer in Latin. And on, I think the right side, he wrote about Carly and the Hereafter. And when I had a reading with Suzanne Giesman, it was probably a year later. I know you're not supposed to put conditions on a reading, and I didn't know that at the time, but I held the book and I called it my Bible. And I asked Carly to please, in this reading, oh. mention, have this book mentioned. And Suzanne said to me, she said, I see a book and I see a Bible, but it's not a Bible. It's an autographed book. And as an author, I guess you, you autograph on the right side. She said, but this was autographed on the left as well as the right. There we go. <laughs> wow. So. Yeah. By the way, you know, Rhonda and I, as, as you know, we've had the privilege to do a, multiple readings and research with Suzanne Giesman. And she is also one of these truly extraordinarily gifted and caring. She She'll be doing our opening keynote presentation at the conference and the closing. So it'll it'll be very special. And for anyone who's not able to be at the conference, don't worry, because all of that will be live streamed. So if you're interested in being a part of it and, and participating, then you still can. But I just want to uh, interject here that this, this whole experience with George Anderson, the fact that he was at our first conference, the fact that Irene went to see him initially is all because of you, Gary, and it wouldn't have happened otherwise. And so... Um, I, I am, as well as the fact that Brittany's mom got this gift from George Anderson, sure. which was, um, very, it, it, it was pretty amazing to have that happen, to have someone bring a gift that was, um, wasn't it, it looked like it was cross-stitched, right? Um, it was I, a cross-stitch, um, something about being a wonderful mother, something like that. I don't remember exactly what it was, yeah. But he brought it specifically mm -hmm. to Brittany's mom. And um, there were mediums at the conference that said that there's no way that, that that could have happened without him knowing the person beforehand. And there we was know he didn't because only Elizabeth and I knew who was coming. And <laughs> she was only coming, you know, it was only about two weeks before the conference, so. There was no, was no way he would have known that. So um, that's why those kind that event when it happened, and you're confirming it in, under the conditions that you also had this conference happen and the way that it unfolded. Um, that's why it's some of the the most compelling evidence, not just for the reality of certain mediums that they're real, but the but the idea that that 
survival of consciousness is real and that they are very actively involved with us to the extent that we continue to care and wish to connect back with them. It's that it's a two-way sharing um, and it's it's extraordinary. I'll, I'll give a footnote to this, um, to, to this, the George Anderson um, story. I, I had the privilege to go to the screening of the uh, HBO documentary. I went to New York um, and was there. And then we were on a panel, myself and and uh, and John um, and uh, the Lisa Jackson, who had been the 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 uh, uh, the director and so on. And um, afterwards, I then flew to Florida, uh, and I was in a taxi. And the taxi cab driver, you know, because it was late at night, and he wanted to know where, where I had been, and and he was asking questions. And it turned out this taxi cab driver was not your typical ca taxi cab driver. He was actually a, a person who had just finished three years of law school, had taken the bar exam, and was waiting to hear whether he passed the bar so he could then work as an attorney. And so he was. This is the way he was supporting his family was by driving a taxi, okay? So he asked me, he said, he said, I, I said, well, I'd actually been to a, a screening of a documentary that I had the privilege to be part of. And, but I said, it's about a very controversial topic. And he said, what? Um, and remember, this is over 20 years ago. And I said, well, it's on the question of, of you know, life after death and mediums. And he said, well, was there anything in your research that you did that was really convinced you that there was something real here? And I said, well, actually there was. And I told him the story, the George Anderson gift story, which was not quote, part of the formal research. And then I asked him a question and I said, imagine that we were to repeat this experiment. How many times would you have to observe George Anderson accurately get a gift ahead of time before a reading? before you were convinced that it was real? How many times? Because this guy was a, a, a super skeptic. And he was taken aback and he said, I don't know. He said, I honestly don't know. And then he turned around and he said, well, what about you? You're a statistician. How many times would you need to see it? And I realized that I didn't know either. I knew statistically how many it would take in order to be able to be convinced that this was a non-random event. The, the probability of it being random was you know, extraordinarily low. But I didn't really know how many times I had to hear it and see it before I finally accepted that this was true. Now remember, this is 20, this was like 23 years ago. This was 1999 when I was at that taxi cab. Um, and that question about how many times you have to see something before you know it's real um, is in part the, the scientist's dilemma. Um, and we each have our own moments where we reach a certain level where we where we where we know that something is real. Um, and again, George was, of all the kinds of evidence, that, that was one of those categories that was um, the most compelling for, for belief. So. so being able to have George Anderson bring that gift was, was an amazing gift to you as well, obviously. Exactly. And continued to do this for years, for obviously more than 20 years now. Um, but I would love for you to tell just a little bit about the soul phone so that sure. people who haven't ever heard about the soul phone um, can know about your research um, since it is happening right here in Arizona, in Tucson, Arizona, which is very exciting. So maybe you could just sure. tell about it. Well, I have a background in electrical engineering um, oh, also on the sidebar, I have a background in music. I played the electric guitar, which also was electrical. 
So I have an experience with electrical things. Started out as a electrical engineer in college. And, um, and a lot of research that I've done in my career has involved what's called electrophysiology or psychophysiology, which is recording electrical signals, biophysical signals in the body and other things. And so I have a background and think about technology. And it's not surprising if when you really think about it that um, that I would be led toward the, the question as other people have been about, well, if mediums can connect with the energy and spirit of uh, the formerly physical person. Um, by the way, those of you who might be interested to know this, there's a there's emerging in science what's 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 being called post-material science, which is goes beyond materialism to what's called post-materialism. And there is an there's a website called aapsglobal.com. AAPS stands for the Academy for the Advancement of Post-Materials Sciences. And this is a group of scientists from many different fields who are looking at the question of the primacy of consciousness, the primacy of energy, and then seeing the material world as a special case. Anyway, the um, uh, and by the way, you know, um, uh, Mark Anthony's you know recent book about frequency in the soul is again the 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 bridging of physics and and consciousness and spirituality and so on. So the question was, could we improve upon the capacity to connect with spirit by using state-of-the-art technology and theory um, to build the technology which um, would make spirit communication with us possible. Um, and I'm not sure how many of you remember this, but there was a time before Zoom. There was a time before we, we could sit. I mean, I'm sitting in my study right now, surrounded by monitors. And in front of me, the view that I have is what's called the, the gallery view. So I see right now five, 25 faces on the screen. And I know there's 157 people right now all over the, the world who are currently online. And we can have this conversation in real time, globally. And that's what makes this possible. And I remembered asking John Edward about the, the future of developing technology to connect with spirit. And John said to me, and I said, would you, would you, would you um, pursue more the development of mediumship or technology? And he said, you know, Gary says, I really believe in mediumship. And I think it's really important that each of us be able to connect with our loved ones, and, you know, as best we can, both, you know, personally and intuitively, um, but also technologically. And he says, you know, if I want to communicate with my child, it's easier for me to do it by the telephone than it is to do it telepathically. It's easier and more accurate for me to communicate by, by a physical phone than it is by trying to do it by divide. So it's in that spirit of, um, of enhancing communication with technology that I began also, again, secretly to begin work on using state-of-the-art technology um, to potentially detect the presence of spirit. And in a book that I wrote in 2011 called The, uh, the Sacred Promise, How Science is Discovering Spirit's Collaboration with Us in Our Daily Lives, uh, it's one of the first places where I reported on that early secret research using state-of-the-art technology, for example, to detect single photons of light in a pitch black environment, and then to see whether we could detect the light of spirit so that, and the light that was generated by spirit. And I think it's very meaningful that in the mission statement, Irene, you, you know, you talk about the use the phrase light and parents. And I don't know what, what's the exact wording? Shining light parents. <laughs> shining light parents. Okay. Because we're talking about shining light spirit <laughs> and being able to detect. That's where I started in this over a decade ago and was publishing that. The first paper I published in the Journal of Explorer was in, um, was in 2010. So we've been developing this technology. Um, there is a history in broadly in the field of afterlife science called a trans-instrumental communication. 
where earlier pioneers used whatever technology they had, whether it was radios or it was um, uh, audio tape recorders or whatever technology they could have, they could try to give spirit the opportunity to use. Um, but this technology is not designed for maximal, uh, optimal or maximal capability of spirit to use it. And if you're going to have a technology like we now all take for granted, it's got to be replicable. It's got to be reliable. Um, if you're going to use a, a you know, a, a cell phone, for example, and you're going to be texting, you've got to be sh sure that at least 90, that the when you press the, the Y key, the Y key is communicated more than 99% accurately. So it's not sufficient just to have what's called statistical significance in order for technology to be practical. It's got to be virtually 100% practical. And so when you're developing a technology like this, you you first of all have to just document what we what you call the proof of possible. You have to be able to do experiments to show that the possibility of developing a practical technology is real. And we've been doing these kinds of experiments to the point where I'm now convinced that we've established uh, the proof of the possible. Then you have to take it to what I call the proof of the probable which means you have to go from something which is utterly impractical from a technological, from a, from a useful point of view, but absolutely definitive in terms of showing that you could detect the energy of spirit under controlled conditions. You have to get to the point where all of a sudden you can start seeing it with seeing uh, getting replicable results within a relatively short period of time. But then you wanna go from the proof of the probable to the proof of the practical that you actually have a working prototype where instead of, for example, taking 10 minutes of data collection to get a yes, no response, you wanna get it down from 10 minutes to 10 seconds. And it's that final jump from the 10 minutes to 10 seconds. I mean, we were talking about 10 hours of data collection at one point, now it, then we got to 10 minutes. The goal is to go from that 10 minutes to the 10 seconds. And that's when you have breakthrough. That's when you're not just simply, we're seeing the, the light toward the end of the tunnel, but we haven't gotten out of the tunnel and into the light. And the engineer that we work with, Steve Smith, he refers to this as tunnel emergence. Now, by the way, I should also share with you that the term soul phone was a term that came to me, that quote, I coined. And I used that word partly because it was simple to say, it's easy to say soul phone. I use that term partly because we're talking about some of the deepest concepts of humanity, which is spirit and soul. And we'll talk a little bit about the, the differences between those two um, at the Helping Parents Heal conference in my, in my keynote address. But I also use the word soul phone, not just because it, it's poetic and because it's simple to say, and um, it's, uh, it also has a deep scientific significance, but soul is also, you know, it's musical. It's people place, they have soul. And, then, and uh, I played soul music. <laughs> so you put it all together. That's where the term soul phone came. I shared this with you because academics typically think that that word doesn't, it doesn't sound, serious, like, you know, an advanced quantum dynamics technology to detect the, the presence of discarnate, hypothesized discarnate persons. That would be more credible in the academic world, but it doesn't, Very I don't- Very difficult to say then, obviously. <laughs> and, um, I don't think that we'd be able to just talk about that special phone in our house very easily at some point, but yeah. I do have some questions about this sure. phone that are in the chat box. Some of them are just coming directly to me. One of them is asking about, would you be willing to talk about the A team that you work with on the other side um, to develop this whole phone or is that confidential? <laughs> Um, that's a good question, and I think that it deserves um, an open answer. 
um, the we have been privileged um, over the years to having an increasingly increasing number of post-material persons who are actually quite distinguished um, become not just involved with this research, but the, the leaders of this research. Um, and the, the, the evidence for these people's participation, um, I have to be very careful about how I say this, but the, at the bottom line is that the is that because I'm a scientist, I require multiple mediums independently receiving evidence of people collaborating with us um, under control conditions where they wouldn't know, or you know, they wouldn't know that person X was participating with us. Once you once it becomes publicly known, for example, um, that for example. Uh, Albert Einstein or David Bohm have been actively participating in this research for years. Uh, you can no longer have mediums uh, be the ones to validate that they're working on the team. Um, so it's it's sort of like you you can't uh, what's the term of the jury? You know you you can't give information to the jury that will cloud the jury's you know information and, and minds. Uh, they need to be subject to unbiased. Anyway, the answer is that. We've been privileged, and that I've also been privileged, and I should say this, and is it because I ended up marrying someone who who whose mother had passed, and she developed the capacity to connect with her mother after her mother passed, and went on a journey, and and obtained very accurate information. And this was Rhonda, um, my better half, and she uh, ultimately published a book called um, Love Eternal, which chronicles her journey on this evidential path to becoming conclude, concluded her mother was still here and involved with research. And if I remember correctly, it was in the, um, in the second edition of that book that she revealed some of the early work with the, with the A-team um, in that book. So we, there is some, we, we do talk about it somewhat publicly. And what I can, what I can say is that the, that some of these people um, came to us spontaneously very few did we actually invite ourselves or ask to come. Um, the word gets out on the other side. So uh, let me sidebar for a second. In the in the book, The Sacred Promise, for example, um, I started the book by sharing that multiple mediums over the years had spontaneously claimed to me that Albert Einstein was here. And they had messages for me, and he also had messages uh, for the world. And my response was, that's ridiculous. I mean, this was we're talking 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Why would he want to speak with me? And who is going to believe it, even if it were true? Um, and the, uh, you know, and so consequently, I was very reluctant to, to approach the idea. I ultimately became peaceful with it. And I think Irene and Elizabeth, the two of you will appreciate this. I finally became peaceful in accepting the fact that he would want to work with me and work with the team that we had. We call ourselves the B team in the physical. And the reason is because right now he doesn't have too many choices. How many scientists in the world are open to receiving communication from Albert Einstein? The answer is virtually no one. So when there, there aren't that many choices, then there's an increased probability that he will come to who's available. Um, and that I've since you know, come to the conclusion that Rhonda and I and the others that we work with, that we're a good team for people like David and, and Albert um, and others uh, to work with. And, um, the, and we're hoping that that sooner rather than later, um, we'll be able to share more of the history um, of the of the A team. Rhonda and I are currently finishing a book. We don't have the a, a, a title for it yet. The working title is called "The Case for the Soul Phone." Um, but in there, 
Rhonda's section of the book reveals the the A team and the evidence for the A team and how we've come to the conclusion that they are real. And she shares a lot of of the of the people who have been working with us. It's pretty amazing. Do you know of any other uh groups of people in universities uh, throughout the world that are doing this type of research, not necessarily just on the cell phone, but on any type of um, ways to communicate with our loved ones on the other side that are a little bit easier for um, everyday parents to be able to manipulate and, and use to, to talk to their children. I. I mean, I, I don't know myself, and I'm just interested to know if you know of other groups of people who are doing this. Okay, well, if you if you say universities, um, then I would have to say the answer is no. I don't know at a university level whether anyone, in particular, addressing the practical question of how do we increase our capacity to be able to discern, to connect with our loved ones who have passed, and particularly, of course, in the case of parents losing children, our children who have passed. Um, I don't know of any universities, and even institutes that are not part of the universities, like the Institute for Noetic Sciences. Um, there's a the director of research. Um, um, she recently published a book on channeling, and uh, which relates to all of this, but not focused on how do you on the practicality of how do you prove your individual ability to, uh, to connect with. As you know, certain mediums give courses on how to become, you know, mediums, Suzanne's done so, and, and uh, Suzanne Wilson, and there have been multiple people, but not at a not at a level, at a formal level, and not in ones that I think where there have been these substantial breakthroughs. Remember, in the, in the academic world, in the university world, what you're hearing is still taboo. Yeah, this is pretty amazing. I mean, I know that Stanford, as well as Duke University, they have paranormal uh, departments, but this is not something that they are pursuing. We have a question in the chat box, and I think that this might be because we're running out of time, but I, I hate that we are. Um, maybe you could share with us if this is something that's possible. Um, something that Einstein has told you um, that's important to all of us that we all need to hear. Is that a possibility? Well, share the first thing that pops into my head. Um, and this was received through Rhonda. Um, and that is that the uh, when I asked Rhonda to ask David and Albert, and we call it David and Albert, you know, David Bowman, Albert Einstein. Um, what was the essence of a scientific approach to understanding what, quote, spirit is, i.e., how do they exist in a post material realm? And therefore, how would we develop technology to communicate with them? David Bohm said that what they are, the term he used are historical systems. That literally the history of everything that we are from the micro to the macro, from the quantum through the biological organ system and our consciousness, all of that he said was preserved in the quote, vacuum of space. Um, as a historical system. And those are very deep terms. And Albert Einstein then complimented by that, by saying, and we are, his words were, living signals. Not just living energy, but living signals, which means that we can communicate, that we can interact, that we are, that we literally are, quote, broadcasting in the deep meaning of that phrase. And the parallel complementarity between the fact that we're, that we're historical systems and we're living signals, and therefore our loved ones who pass, all of that and more is preserved, um, you know, is very special. 
It is. It's beautiful. And I can't tell you how grateful we are that you were able to join us this evening. I, I think that this has been a wonderful introduction to you speaking to the conference as well. And again, anyone who is not going to be at the conference, although we have 900 parents who are joining us, um, I know a lot of you aren't able to join us. Uh, we will be streaming his um his keynote live um if you aren't able to watch it the same day it's going to be recorded so you'll be able to go back and watch it and you can watch it as many times as you want to over the two months after that so um i'm very grateful for that please tell rhonda that we're grateful that you spoke to us this evening and to yes. leave time to do so and um, thank you gary thank you i'll always be so grateful for what what you have done and what you continue to do. Thank you. And it's we been a always, privilege to be part of the, the team. Oh, thank you. And we always ask everybody to unmute and to say thank you and good evening. So if you all would like to do thank that. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. <laughs>